This week on Arts Insight, ancient art comes to modern Houston. And these were really the first artists, the Crow Magnum during this time period. A celebration of the fruit, the orange, and orange juice. Born on the bayou. You'd never know that we're in America's fourth largest city. We go for a drive in the park. <laughs> this is a great art cart made by Rebecca Bass. And the arts are providing some local parks with a spark. For every spark park, the community and the school design the park. We've got all that and more coming up. I'm Ernie Manoose, and it's time to get arts in sight. <laughs> Welcome to Arts Insight, coming to you today from the Houston Museum of African American Culture. We'll let you know what's going on here in a moment. But first, since 2012, we've spoken with Houston's arts community about everything from art in the park to modern art. But our first segment features work that's anything but modern. We're back at the Houston Museum of Natural Science where they have a wonderful exhibit called Scenes from the Stone Age. And to tell us a little bit more about it is Amanda Norris. Hello, Amanda. Hi, Ernie. This is very impressive. It is. It's almost too much for words when you look at it. Well, and to help people place exactly what we're looking at, these are pretty much the oldest artwork of man? They are what we consider right now the oldest artwork. As you know, we're finding things every day. But right now, these guys are about 20,000 years old. They were found in France in the 1940s. So these are the replicas of those caves. And they tell us a lot about what was going on in their world, plus their idea of how to present art. Exactly, and these were really the first artists, the Crow Magnum during this time period, which these guys were not migrators, so they stayed in one place and they got to see animals as the seasons change and their migratory patterns of animals come and go. Speaking of animals coming and going, these caves were discovered by an animal. They were, by a little dog. He um, found a little opening, was digging in it, and his four companions that were with him, four young boys, teenagers, um, were interested in what he was digging up, and they kind of moved some rocks and some things around, and they walk in and they find all of this. So it was quite a discovery um, for these four teenage boys and would make them pretty famous around the world. Help me understand a little bit about how they actually did the artwork. Um, from what we gather based on the things found in the cave, it would probably be a team of people coming in, and Cro-Magnum people, these, these are us, these are our people, um, with someone holding a lamp of some sort that would be your light source. So imagine flickering lights, nothing like the bright lights so when you're going to color now in a studio. Um, they would have had natural pigment from the area, some kind of oak grid, which would give you your reds and browns and yellows, black for your magnesium. And they used horse hair brushes. And people ask, well, how do you know it was horse hair? Well, you can look at the strokes and you can see what it looks like. So artists have gone in and looked at these caves and said, oh, that's, that's horse hair. They've used their fingers to rub things around. They've used homemade sponges using animal hide to make the bigger areas. Um, they, all sorts of different different techniques, really cool one. They found these hollowed out bones with a little pigment in it. So we think the first kind of spray painting, so to speak, they would blow through that. An airbrush, through that, early an airbrush, airbrush. Early airbrush. So to find out more about this, where do people go? You go to hms.org and you can learn everything you need to know about scenes from the Stone Age. Amanda, thank you very much. You're welcome. Welcome back to the Houston Museum of African American Culture. The museum has made it their mission to engage visitors of every background with discovery-driven learning. And here to tell us what that means is CEO John Guess. Hello, John. Hi, Ernie. How are you doing? Fabulous museum here. Some people don't know about it, but a lot of people do. A lot of people do. That's right. Yeah. You've been growing the museum over the last few years. And tell me some of the projects you've done to help encourage people to come out and see it. Oh, God. We've done everything. We've had multiple Pulitzer Prize winners. We've had poet laureates, Rita Dove, uh, who had a reading for us at the Manila Collection. We've had a fabulous symposium on the African presence in Mexico that was organized by HMAC, as we're called, and the Johns Hopkins Center for Africana Studies on, uh, with scholars from Mexico and the United States who actually went into high schools, came here. We did a great symposium on the Afropolitans. It was the second, these are Africans who exist culturally in Europe, in Africa, and the United States. If we think of the museum as just a gallery where you're hanging paintings, we're way off. Oh, you're way off. Oh, this <laughs> is, listen, HMAC essentially is an experience. 
uh, and it's so much more. You've got film, we've got exhibits, we've got programs. One of the highlights, our first exhibition, in fact, was Fort H. Mac, which was done by Odabinga Jones. Uh, and that exhibition was groundbreaking, uh, brought in tremendous amount of attendance. And then our second, our first original exhibition, Rue, ended up traveling to, first went out, ended up traveling to Arkansas and then ended up in New York. As important as the remembrance of Martin Luther King is, you won't see a lot of that in this museum, and why? Well, we'll celebrate Black History Month in February, but we're a contemporary museum, and the way that we approach it, if you think Langston Hughes is important, and we do, uh, we say that Langston Hughes is one generation's poet, just like for my generation, Smokey Robinson was a poet, just like for this generation, Kanye West is a poet. And if you want to get people to really know who Langston Hughes is today, with a current group of people, you need to relate Langston Hughes to Kanye West. And so we take a very contemporary point of view, but we'll weave back into the history like that. We opened in February of 2012 on a daily basis, and we're online to hit 30,000 visitors this year. Which is this, wonderful for any museum, that's great. Well, I'll tell you something, they come from all over the world. Why do we need this museum? Why us? Because on any given day, if you go to an, any other museum, you aren't gonna see African Americans. You always will here. And of course, you know, this is Houston, so, <laughs> any given day at every museum you should see, or here and there, you're gonna see we add to the mix of when they're not there, Latinos. Uh, we add to the mix of Africans. So that in the soup, in the pot, in the stew, we sort of fill out the cultural milieu for, for the museum district. To learn more about the museum and everything, where can they find the information? You can find the information at www.hmaac.org. Or go to our Facebook page, which is really, really happening. And like you. Like us a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. Up next, what do you get when you combine a postal worker, a possible hoarding habit, and a love of oranges? Well, you get a Houston landmark. Welcome back to The Orange Show. Joining us now to tell us more about this monumental work of handmade architecture is Orange Show board member Sharon Capriva. Hello there. Hi. I'm... Okay, for somebody's first time here, what is this? Well, it's been called so many things, but the art historians call this an environmental work of folk art. Let's go back to a little of the history. Art art. Sure. Where did the idea come from? What was this initially? Uh, it was an empty lot. And the gentleman, Jeff McKissick, who built this single-handedly over 20-something years, lived across the street, and he was a mail carrier. And uh, I think he gathered many things on his route when, after he delivered mail. And he actually opened the Orange Show, 1979, I believe, and he died the next year. It's all about the fruit, the orange, and orange juice. And it's a shrine to that fruit, and he, because Jeff McKissick believed if you ate enough oranges, you'd live to be 100. How old was he when he died? 78. <laughs> Not enough oranges. But if you want to learn more, you can, of course, visit yeah. them on their website at orangeshow.org. And those who loved it and, and watched him work for years uh, bought it from his nephew. And uh, at that time, it was just to preserve this monument. But since then, it just has become such a vital part of the Houston art community that in the, and the active part of the art community. So it, we've gone from preserving one monument of one deceased man to an active environment where people come to be creative, to see creativity, to hear creativity, and to be part of the creativity in Houston. In that interview, they mentioned hearing creativity at the Orange Show, which is why we caught up with Chiram Parantan, an up-and-coming Japanese musical duo at the Houston Folk Art Treasure. Chiram Parantan, this is difficult. So we are a pair of sisters from Tokyo, and my name is Koharu, um, 25, and I play the accordion, and next to me is my sister, Momo, who is the vocalist. We've been playing for about three years now, but I've been playing accordion since I was younger, and you know, doing my own accordion thing on the side, until three years ago I invited my sister to join me, and we formed a band. <laughs> Thank you. 
It is a rare instrument in Japan, um, especially the type that I play. It's both sides are buttons. And how I started was when I was seven, I went to a circus performance with my mom. There was an accordion player at the show. I just kind of fell in love and I asked my mom to get me an accordion on the spot. The meaning might mean crazy girls. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so the meaning, there's not like an exact translation for the meaning of our band name, but um, Chanpurantan is also, it's sort of like, a, it's on the beat. Chanpurantan, that's one of the reasons why we chose it. And that's sort of how we define ourselves as well. It's hard to place our music in a, in a specific genre. I mean, when we do, we sort of say alternative chanson or, or world music, but it's hard to sort of put everything into one genre. And we sort of just play whatever we feel like. One of the big influences we think is probably movies. Um, you know, like old, especially old American movies are really popular in Japan as well. And then we get a lot of influences from there. Like in Japan, it's actually Moon River, the Monkey, these kind of songs are really popular. And especially in the genre that we play, it's sort of a song that everyone kind of knows how to do and sort of something that you don't have to practice and you just kind of pick it up. We don't know gender We don't know any other duos like us, especially wearing this costume, you know, playing this type of music. It's pretty rare. Basically what we do with our costumes is I draw like sort of designs and I give them to my mom and my grandma and they sort of make them. That's how basically how we come up with our costumes. We first started out, actually Momo, her stage presence and everything was not very good. So to sort of distract the viewer's attention from that, we just decided to have her hold this pig and then it sort of just stuck from there. It's kind of like our lucky charm right now. And it's also made by my mom. We'd love to like build a circus tent and like travel the world like that with our band and especially like a place like this would be perfect. You know? We'd love to just travel our band, play music and travel the world like this. Welcome back. When Houston was settled in 1836, the Allen brothers had a vision to transform a mosquito-infested swamp into a bustling metropolis. And years later, the best views of modern Houston come from the body of water that started it all. Buffalo Bayou Partnerships and Olson took us aboard the Spirit of the Bayou for a boat ride through the city. And hello, Ann. Hello, Ernie. Thanks for having me. So this is wonderful. I didn't know this little treasure was here. Here we are, right on the bayou. You'd never know that we're in America's fourth largest city. And right by downtown. Right by downtown, maybe two minutes with a beautiful skyline in the background. And there's been a lot of construction going on along here. Yes, it's a $58 million project that Buffalo Bayou Partnership is doing in cooperation with the city hike and bike trails, brand new dog park that will feature two ponds for dogs. Um, we'll be extending the blue lighting that is already along the bayou. We'll also be having some areas where you can go out and rent a canoe, kayak, or bike. So it's really an amazing project. It's all set to be completed by June of 2015. Okay, tell me a little about those blue lights. Everyone sees them. What's the plan behind that? They're really very interesting and I don't think people realize the concept, but over a 29 day period, along with the phases of the moon, they turn from white to blue and back to white again. Just a really beautiful sight. 
And we started off down by Allen's Landing. We sure did, and there's a revitalization effort underway there as well to restore the historic building called the Sunset Coffee Building. And that also will have a canoe, kayak, bike rental facility there. Okay, and we can't miss the fact that we are actually on a boat traveling down the bayou. These boats are out here for everyone. They truly are. We have incredible tours, a history tour, and we have bat tours as well. That's great. And to find out everything that you folks are up to, they can visit your website at? Just visit our website at buffalobayou.org. Welcome back. Just up the block from the bayou sits Market Square Park, home of Houston's first city hall. And Blaffer Art Museum's Claudia Schmuckley joined us to explain how art has helped combine the area's history with present times. Well, just to provide a little context about the project, the downtown district um, approached us about a year and a half ago to develop uh, public programs around Market Square um, and uh, thought it was a great opportunity to sort of really look at the square and look at the sites that were available and identified you know, a facade and the clock tower in particular as a site that we wanted to work in and uh, enlisted the help of the Houston Arts Alliance to uh, approach Joanne with this outrageous proposition to transform the clock tower into uh, something else, a piece of sculpture that lives here and that really redefines how we see and experience the tower. A lot of my work sort of takes existing architectural structures and transforming them into something different. And when I came down here, I was very fascinated by the clock tower. So I thought it would be a really sort of wonderful thing to address in terms of what the relevancy of a clock tower is, of a bell tower, of a bell, in terms of our digital age. We're not using a clock tower to bring us to church. We're not using it to tell us of an emergency or really to tell time at this point. And so I wanted to deal with that whole idea of what the relevancy of the clock tower was. So both, are both architecturally and conceptually. So visually what I wanted to do is I sort of wanted to make the architecture disappear. And the way I did that was I applied mirrored surfaces on the inside columns of all of the clock tower. And that way it virtually makes the brick disappear as it reflects on itself. Another aspect is that instead of it being a functional thing, I wanted to transform it into a performative kind of piece. And at that point, that is when I started um, approaching Anthony Brandt and Chapman Welch at Shepherd School of Music to collaborate on a musical piece. And so the idea of the bell tolling is no longer tolling for the hour, okay? So the whole idea was, was kind of messing with people's perception of time. So the tolling is now consists of street noise that they have recorded and they have filtered out the street noise till it becomes pure tones and pure chords on the scale. And then they have manipulated those chords and put them into a computer. So one minute before the hour and one minute after the hour, it has a sort of mini musical composition. Then as night falls, the, the clock tower transforms itself. And as you look on the clock tower faces, there are images that all have to do with different concepts of time that sort of start to um, appear as darkness falls and they are illuminated from the back. Well, we hope that everyone will come out here and experience what you've done with the clock tower and enjoy the, the new birth of an old landmark. Thank you. Thank you. To find out more about what's going on at the Blaffer, where do they go? Go to blaffartmuseum.org. Thank you both Thank very you. much. Thank you. <laughs> In just five years, Discovery Green has managed to become a major part of Houston's social heartbeat. And free concerts and events aren't the only things you'll find there. As Suzanne Tice showed us, Discovery Green also has a lot of great art. There's art everywhere in this park. There sure is. But, and we're sitting in something. <laughs> this is a great art cart made by Rebecca Bass, the fabulous art teacher who's made so many incredible art cars with her students at Walter Pye School and other schools. So she made a dragon cart and on the weekends you can come and borrow uh, hula hoops or, or croquet balls or anything you want to play with at the park on now, the weekends. Art is important to you folks here at Discovery Green and there's a whole lot more. There's, you want to see it? I'd love I'll show to. you. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> so what is this? Well this is the Monument au Fantôme. It's by the French artist Jean Dubuffet and we're really proud to have it here at Discovery Green. It harmonizes with the colors of the George R. Brown. It's also 
to me, really lovely to be able to see this with the cityscape behind it. So this always catches my eye when I'm in the park. This is Margot Sawyer's Synchronicity of Color Blue. Uh, we have another set over here called Red also. Her art is about how we synchronize, how we find harmony in our differences. And these brilliantly colored boxes cover the stairwell to the underground garage. Now when people come to the park, it often gets pretty warm here, but your art also helps cool people off. That's right. We have a mist tree, and it's a, a, a wonderful work of art created by a San Francisco-based artist whose name is Doug Hollis. And all of Doug's work is about the way that the environment and nature integrate with the human experience. This is the listening vessel. And when one person sits here and whispers, the person sitting over there can hear it. Oh, you know we got to try it out. So Suzanne, how do I find out more information? www.discoverygreen.com I can hear you. I can hear you too. It's magic. Now let's go from one park to another. At first glance, the playground at Wilson Elementary School in Montrose might look like any other schoolyard, but it's actually an artful spark park. What's that, you ask? Kathleen Ownby has the answer. So explain the concept of these spark parks. Well, the program started in 1983, and it was all um, from a green ribbon study done on how to increase park space in the city of Houston and Harris County. And one idea in the report was to make use of public school grounds. And so from that one sentence in that report, um, Eleanor Tinsley was on city council at that point, and she took that idea and ran with it. And so the cool thing is that not only are they reusing the purposed areas, the given areas, but you've turned them into kind of art oasises here too. And so we are sitting on one of those pieces because they are multi-use also, just like right. the parks themselves. Right. Tell me a little about this piece. This piece is called Birds of Peace. Um, it was designed and installed by a local artist, Elena Cousy Wortham, who um, in fact had two um, granddaughters that attended this school. So now to help people understand, they can come to the parks when school isn't in session, when in the evenings and on weekends. Right, after school and on the weekends, that's our one rule with Spark Parks, is that uh, there must be a pedestrian gate open after school and on weekends for the community to use the park. And since we're talking parks, what else is there here to do in this park? Oh gosh, there is lots of stuff to do. And this is one of our newest parks and one of our biggest parks and one of our most expensive parks <laughs> um, and certainly very um, loved by the community. This, we're right in the heart of Montrose area right now. And so um, the, for every Spark Park, the community and the school design the park. So all of our parks are going to be different. One of the priorities was a soccer field because um, the community really wanted a place to play soccer. And then we have a track that goes around it. And if you come in the afternoon or on the weekends, you will see people walking, you will see people running. And so it's very well used. And then you have playground equipment, which you see in back of us, um, for kids to certainly play on during the school day, but then also after school and on the weekends. And the children at the school do get involved in the design of the park too. Oh, definitely, definitely. So a wonderful way of bringing the community and art together. And to find out more information, where can they look online? sparkpark.org. Thank you. Uh-huh, thank you. If you've driven around town lately, you're sure to have seen the new Metro Rail stations going up. It might not be a pretty picture at the moment, but Metro's Margaret O'Brien Molina recently took some time to explain how that's going to change once the trains start rolling down the tracks. Hello there, Margaret. There. It's good to see you. It is great to see you. All right, you folks are doing something that is just wonderful, and it's taking, in a sense, away the graffiti and advertising from these stops by putting in art. Explain how that works. We love it. I mean, right now, it's a chance, like, to bring great transit to Houston via these railways and everything, but also because of the placement within the communities, creating art spaces there, it allows us to tell the story of these communities. When you put the art there, a lot of times, we found that the graffiti artists tend to stay away from it because it's already a decorated space. So it's a great thing. But so, that's, we'll, so it works on multiple layers this way. Multiple layers. And it also educates the community and it also empowers communities 
communities too, because it really tells their story. And for many of the places, architecturally, people talk about Houston, we're always tearing things down. Here's a place where we're really building things up and also bring, incorporating elements of Houston's history and just its different cultures because we have such a diverse city. And here you see it represented in all its different, different magnifications. And everyone usually thinks when you think, oh, they're building train station stops, that it's going to be bleak, it's going to be these concrete mass. And you guys, by putting the art in, have made them not only reflective of the community, but a beautiful place to be. This has been an enormous process. It's gone on since 2006. Sarah Kellner has curated this whole piece and working with so many different community and artists. We've got 14 artists, 12 of them are from Houston. They're all nationally recognized figures. There's been art experts and what it's doing also is bringing a lot of national recognition and even international recognition to our city because of our great artists. So it's going to be wonderful to be able to see them in a, and, and see Houston, frankly, in a whole new light in 2014. The other two lines will come on. So we'll have 22 miles of new rail line in Houston. So we're very, very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. You can find out more at gometrorail.org. We hope you enjoyed our look back on this week's edition of Arts Insight. Make sure to join us every Thursday night for the best arts coverage from Houston and beyond. For Arts Insight, I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching and have a great week.